Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Christmas again, it's so good to see you. Let me ask you this question. What do you want for Christmas this year? Now, I know a lot of children might be able to answer that one real quick. A lot of our teenagers, maybe. You've got something on your mind. You could answer it quickly. What do you want? I remember when I was a little kid, the one thing, one Christmas, all that I wanted, I was obsessed with Batman for like several years. And all I wanted was a Batmobile. I had the Bat, you know, outfit, the cape. I had a Bat belt, utility belt. And a bat rope. I had, a, I had all the bat stuff, but I didn't have a batmobile. There was a batmobile. You remember the, like the little cars I suppose you still can, can pedal. And I just wanted the batmobile. And sure enough, Christmas came and I got the batmobile. And it was so fun. And then a few years later, I, I suppose several years later, I was about uh, maybe late elementary school. All I wanted was drum set. Because I thought drummers were cool, and I wanted to be a drummer. So I long, you know, the Batmobile was gone, and, and I was getting older, grew, outgrew the Batmobile. So I got, sure enough, got drums for Christmas. And um, my parents quickly regretted uh, allowing Santa to bring the drums because I was really enthusiastic about drums. And... Uh, then the years passed, and of course, drums are gone. I have no idea where those drums are. Such is the, the story of so many gifts, things that we want. And, you know, I desperately wanted those things. Kind of a parable of the gifts of this life that come, and they go, and we forget all about them. Let me ask you this question. Maybe the better question is, what do you need this Christmas? What do you really need? need. And I would suggest to you that what you need this year more than anything is the actual abiding reality, the actual existing presence of the Spirit of God in your life. So we're talking about this Christmas presence. This present, the presence of God in your life will be with you all year long every day. We've said it this way, Christmas reminds us of our greatest need and our greatest gift. Last week we said that you cannot truly be grateful for Christmas until you truly grapple with your need for Christ in your life and for his spirit in your life. And of course, that's why many of us don't experience the power of God in our lives. We don't think we need him in our lives. And many of us have forgotten the power of the Holy Spirit. I love what pastor theologian J.N. Darby, he was a a brethren, author, I suppose, pastor in the 1800s, he said it this way, necessity finds him out. You will only come to God as you need him. You'll only experience his power as you need him. So last week we asked three questions. If you weren't here last week, what did Jesus do? How did he do it? And what is our response? We looked at Matthew 1 for one of the passages there. You can see it. She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now listen, this word Jesus, Yeshua, is what it means. Yahweh saves is what that means. Yeshua in the, in the Hebrew. We would say God saves. Call him God saves. His name would be Jesus, and then it says there explicitly, for he will save his people from their sins. As this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, this is Isaiah, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Look at this. His name is Yeshua, God saves. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. This is Christmas presence, Christ coming in the flesh, the incarnation. Now let's read this together. John 1, 14, let's proclaim this together. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, 
glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now this word, word you've, you've read that before perhaps, the, the word, this word is logos in the Greek. It means, literally, it means purpose or meaning of life. Think about that. The purpose of life took on flesh. Christ, the meaning, the center of life, the Word of God became flesh in Jesus. Now we have, in the Bible, we have the Word of God written to us. In Jesus, we have the living Word given to us. So Christmas reminds us that we are the visited planet. Our need was so great, God showed up in person to show us that he exists, to live the perfect life on our behalf, to, listen, die a physical death, suffer physically, taking on the punishment of our sin, to die physically, to be raised physically in his glorified body, and now reigning as king forever. You see, he came in the flesh to do all those things. He had to come. And then our response, as we've said even today already, is a life of worship. But as difficult as this is for many of us to grasp, all of us, how could God become a man and live in the flesh in a person? Now, as hard as that is, it might be harder still for some of us to get our minds around, how can God then now live in me by his Spirit, guiding me and leading me? We're going to talk about this today. I want you to turn to John chapter 14. Everyone turning in the scripture to John 14, it's a passage where Jesus is speaking. It's the upper room. Now, while you're turning there, a number of people are consistently highlighted, you know, when we have uh, narratives of the Christmas story. Of course, we think of the angels. We think of shepherds. We think of wise men. We think of Mary and Joseph and, of course, the baby Jesus. But I want to suggest that there's another who's central to the story, who doesn't make it into our narrative often when we tell the story. And I'm not talking about the innkeeper, who, by the way, is not in the Bible. It says that the inn, the hotels, there was no vacancy, no, no place to stay. I'm talking about the unseen, central figure in all of God's work here on earth. It's the Holy Spirit. But I want you to see this. Before we look at John 15, he's front and center. He is the Holy Spirit guiding everything. John the Baptist's parents, Elizabeth, is said to be full of the Spirit. Zacharias was filled with the Spirit when his son was born, it says. The angel Gabriel said to, to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. Simeon, the elder, when he came to the temple to see baby Jesus, says he was full of the Spirit. And it also says that the Spirit guided him to the temple so that he could see, as he said, the salvation of God right before him. The Spirit of God is always guiding and leading in ways we cannot see. And now the Spirit is living in us. And you and I can experience Christmas presence all year long as we seek to follow Jesus every day. Okay, so let's look at this. John 14, this is a fantastic passage. Look at verse 15. Jesus says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now let's pause for a moment. Look at this, the connection between loving him and obeying him. First, we must love him, then we're motivated properly to obey him. Again, our obedience is a response to his great love for us. It's not even that we love him first, but that he loves us. Look at verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Notice, another helper. Even the Spirit of truth. He calls him the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Spirit dwells among us, and he dwells in us. We're going to see. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. This is beautiful. 
I will come to you. Yet a little while the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Now he's about to go to the cross. This is that Thursday night. They're in the upper room, and he's about to go to the cross the next day. He's going to be buried. He's going to be gone for a little while. He says, but you're going to see me because I live, and then you're going to live. In that day, you will know, look at verse 20, this is amazing, that I am in, the, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, when we receive Christ, we enter into this, this uh, Trinitarian dance, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, us. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship, except that each one benefits from the other. And we benefit, clearly, from being in this relationship. Verse 21, this is the mystery of the Spirit. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So he says again what he had said in verse 15. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So he's saying this relationship with the Trinity is guided by love. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest, okay, show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, wow, he's back to loving him, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now listen, Jesus' answer here, it sounds like a non sequitur. It sounds like it doesn't follow logic. He asks a question. How are you going to show, why are you going to show yourself to us but not to the world? And Jesus seems to answer in a way that, ping, you know, diverts or goes a different direction altogether. But what is he saying? He's answering the question very clearly. He's saying, listen, the spirit is going to be in you. And others are going to see the Spirit as you obey, as you love me. They're going to see you in me. Look at verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, earlier, the Spirit of truth. Now, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then we could go on, and this is a beautiful passage. Peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. I give you peace in a different way. Now, this is a, a fantastic passage, and I'm excited about teaching this. You know, a lot of churches I've seen, maybe you've been to other churches, they're obsessed with the Holy Spirit. And I mean mostly in regard to experiences, often emotional uh, encounters. You know, kind of demonstrative responses. In fact, they measure, you know, the work of the Spirit in their lives or maybe even corporately in worship. You know, how people are going to respond physically, tangible ways. In other churches, people just want doctrine. They just want to be taught. They just want to know the right things. Now, generally, I think Baptists are kind of just mostly confused about the work of the Spirit. And I say that, actually, we kind of fall in the middle, and I think this is kind of the place to be. It's what Francis Chan uh, calls the, the forgotten God, the third person of the Trinity that we don't talk nearly enough about. Now listen, in January, we're going to devote an entire month preaching, teaching on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to get there. But in verse 15, he has said, so keep my commandments. But listen, I want you to hear this. It's possible to try to obey the Bible without hearing from the one who wrote the Bible. It's possible to enter into a religion called Christianity and not hear from the Spirit of God in your life. Listen to what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they, carried, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Maybe you know that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says the word of God, every word of scripture was God-breathed. The word of God guides us to the spirit of God as we seek to obey him, but we cannot obey him without the power of the spirit. This is why Jesus says, if you're going to obey me, you're going to love me, you're going to obey me. Then he enters straight in to talking about how the Spirit's going to come. So, let's do this. Let's talk about the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. All right? So if you take notes on sermons, I want to talk about really three questions. Who is the Holy Spirit? I'm going to spend some time on that. Then we're going to answer two final questions for application. How can I receive the Holy Spirit? And then how can I walk in the Spirit? Okay, so first, the gift of the Spirit. This is the greatest gift that you can receive at Christmas time. Okay? This is the word uh, parakletos in the, in, the, in the Greek. You may have heard that before, the paraclete. Okay, so who is the Holy Spirit? First, Jesus says he's another helper. We said that, verse 16, the parakletos. It's a different word, it's a difficult word to translate. Your translation might say uh, comforter. Uh, the ESV says helper. Other translations say counselor. Some say advocate. We'll talk about more of that in a moment. So secondly, he is the spirit of truth in verse 17. Notice that he's given, that he's sent by God. Only those who have received Christ have received the Spirit or can receive the Spirit of God. He leads us in truth. He helps us under, understand Scripture. The Spirit speaks truth into our lives. And listen, namely, he speaks the truth of the gospel into our lives, reminding us of who we are. So to be filled with the Spirit, we'll talk much about this uh, later, but um, in January, to be filled with the Spirit is to experience the truth of God, the truth of who you are. It's interesting, in Ephesians 3, uh, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, and then there's a list of things, actually Ephesians 5, 18, there's a list of things that are evidence, really, of the Spirit moving among His people. And then in Colossians 3, he says, be filled with the truth. Be filled with the word of truth. And there's a list that, it, that describes then what that looks like. The, the two lists are the same. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the truth, to be saturated with the word of God, the truth of God, and that then fills us with the Spirit. Not simply facts. He dwells in you richly. The Spirit of God. It's more of an obsession but it's, not, it's more than just like your junior high boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, where you're infatuated. You think about them all the time. Okay, you do that. It's an obsession of the Spirit, but He actually lives in you. But look at this next point here. He is personal. He is a person. Verse 17, not it. He's not an it, but Him. See what Jesus says there in verse 17? Him, He, the Spirit is a person. The Spirit can be grieved the Spirit can be quenched. The Spirit can be outraged, the Scriptures tell us. The Spirit loves, convicts, comforts. An impersonal being can't feel those things. An impersonal being can't do those things. This is not kind of the Star Wars force, some impersonal force. Eastern religions go there. Not a personal relationship, a person filling you up. Eastern religions, you know, it's a blowing out of the mind. It's an emptying of the mind. In Christianity, only do you have the filling of the mind and the filling of the heart with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a person. Jesus says you're obeying. Listen, whoever obey, obeys Him, you're obeying a person. Friends, listen, this changes everything. When you see the Holy Spirit as a person, not cold religious commands, but a person that we're obeying. So don't miss this then. We've said it. He is God. Not only is he a person, he's God. He's not only uh, here with us in person. He's the third person of the Trinity. Jesus says another counselor. Now listen to this. He says there's another counselor. This word another, there's two words for another in the Greek. One is hetero. You know that one there, that's heterosexual. That means not like the former. It even means opposing the former, male and female in that case. There's another word in the Greek, it's allos. It means like the former. This is the word that Jesus uses here. He's saying there's another counselor who's like, listen, me. I'm going to leave and it's to your advantage, he says in chapter 17, that I leave. We're on the backside of the advantage that the Spirit now comes to us. Listen, closer than our own skin, nearer to you than your own breath, your own heartbeat within you. I know, like me, you would love to say, man, I'd love to see Jesus in the flesh. And this is what his disciples were saying. No, 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 you can't go. And he says, no, 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 the Spirit 
is going to come. The Holy Spirit, it's God sending someone like me, Jesus says, to you. We see this in verse 16 and verse 26. All right, now here it is. Look at this. The next point here. He is in the heart of every believer. The Holy Spirit is the personal, divine resident of the Christian's life. He is living in you if you've received the Spirit. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Listen, it's not three gods. It's not God in three forms. It's God in three persons. Now that's easy. Now you got your mind around that, right? This is the dizzying doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's a mystery. He's bigger than we can get our minds around. But the etymology of the word helps us here. I said that parakletos, it can mean comforter, it can mean helper, it can mean counselor, it can mean all these things because all of those things are correct. But really, the etymology of the word, when you get underneath it, it starts to reveal something altogether different. The last point that I want to make. The word paraclete, para means to come alongside. Kletos means uh, a, a, a personal aid. It, it really means, uh, the word was used to describe a counsel for defense. It's a word that means you have a personal, legal advocate, a person who argues for you, who's come alongside you to argue for you. So here's the final point I want to make here. The Spirit is, He is our advocate. The Spirit argues for us. He is to defend us. And listen, He's to defend you against your enemies, but namely, listen, the enemy in your mind. The enemy that tells you lies about yourself. Look at what it says in Romans 8. You can see it on the screen. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now listen, if I were a woman, women sitting here going, and you read this in Scripture, right? You say, well, wait, sons, what about me? Well, listen, this is very intentional and powerful. The son was the heir to all things, right? And the elder son would receive the inheritance from the father. This is actually very intentional. Listen, daughters, you've become sons, heirs. You were formerly not. Now we're all sons, heirs to all that he has for us. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You know he's your, he's your dad. He's your loving father. The Spirit himself bears witness. This is the same language here. He bears witness with our spirit. He's the advocate that comes along and argues for us. And mostly to us. Listen, the Spirit argues against us. For us. I know we have some attorneys in the room who understand this, maybe more than the rest of us. Witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, his son, Pro provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What's he saying there? He's saying, hey, if we go through the bad stuff with him, we're certainly going to get the good stuff with him as well. Bears witness. Listen, this is like the star witness in court, the one who settles the case. This is who the Spirit is in us. The Spirit reminds you of the gospel and he reminds you of your true identity, of who you really are. Because when we get off track and we don't remember who we are, we believe the lies of the evil one, that's what leads us to sin. That Christ is not enough. We forget who we are. The Spirit argues against you. And remind you of who you are. First John says this, for, who, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. When your heart condemns you, the Holy Spirit reminds you of the gospel. No, 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 no. You're forgiven. No, no, no. You are a son, a daughter, a child of God. He's the spirit of truth. Namely, he's preaching the gospel. The spirit argues for you, the Spirit argues against you for you. The Spirit convicts you. The Spirit challenges you. You know, many times through the years as a pastor, I've been involved, maybe you have been, 
in some interventions where loved ones or friends come along and say, we've got to rescue a friend. We've got to step in. Maybe there's an addiction or a a marital affair, some destructive behavior. And listen, loving friends will not let you destroy yourself. They'll intervene. They'll speak truth. And when that happens, you oppose them. You argue against them. You come against them. This is what the Holy Spirit does. If we're listening, walking with the Spirit, the Spirit is constantly arguing, listen to this, stepping in, intervening, convicting us of our sin, constantly correcting us. If you're walking with the Spirit. So his key role is not to give you goosebumps or some spiritual buzz. Or as a student said after youth camp, the Lord gave her a holy headbutt. All right, that's good. Um, I like that. Just woke her up uh, spiritually. But really... He has come, his primary role, the main thing, is to remind us of the gospel. I'm going to close with application. Real quick, how can I receive the Holy Spirit? Well, it's real easy. Jesus says there's another helper. So there's another one that's come. So first, listen, you must receive the first advocate, Jesus Christ as Lord. When you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit. We already have an advocate with the Father. We have an advocate who's already, listen, Jesus, the Spirit, not pleading our case. He has settled his case. Jesus has settled our case. See, other religions have a scale of justice, right? You can, you can uh, outdo your bad works, your good works. If they do, then you're going to be okay. But how could you ever know that you're good enough? And in Jesus, the scales of justice have been crushed, Because he has fulfilled the law, lived the perfect life on our behalf. Listen, I could say it this way. You know, we say that we're saved by faith, right? Saved by grace, not by works. I could say, no, 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 we're saved by works. Just someone else's works. Christ lived the perfect life on our behalf so that we can Receive this greatest gift of Christmas, the present of salvation and the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible thing. I'll close with the final question. How can I walk in the Spirit? Two things. First, listen. I think I've reminded you today of the Spirit's work in your life. Be alert. Be aware. Listen for the Spirit as you read His Word. John 10 says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, they obey me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. They know his voice, they obey him. Listen and obey. This is how you walk in the spirit. Be obedient to him, stay in his word, the spirit speaks because if we live by the spirit, Galatians 5, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. I love that. You know, we move forward in discipleship, not mainly through pep talks or stern warnings. We move forward in discipleship when we learn anew, hear anew the strangeness of grace, the gospel that reminds us of the great love that God has for us. It it, it gives peace to our hearts, and it loosens us of the things of this world. And it brings freedom to our lives. So Christmas presence means that Christ has come in the flesh and his spirit is now living in me. We become God's temple. This is why collectively the church is called the body of Christ. The visible presence where others can see that in us, we are now the place, wherever we go, the places where heaven meet earth and people see God alive in us. So listen, it's the Father's job. It's the Father's job to judge us. It's Christ's job to save us. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us. And it's our job to listen, to obey, and to love. This is Christmas presence. Let's pray together as we close. Lord, thank you so much for your presence, even speaking now through me, through your word. 
You've taught us today what it is to live, to walk in the Spirit. Lord, I pray for those who do not know you today. Friend, if you're here and you are not certain that you have received Christ, you can do so now. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I received that gift, that great present of grace that you've given me. Perhaps you have received Christ, but you've not been walking in the Spirit. We do not do this alone. The Lord's calling you perhaps to join the church today. Come for baptism, as we've seen today, to show the world that you've been saved and you're full of the Spirit of God. Lord, thank you that we are not alone. We thank you that we can come faithful, ready to serve you and to obey you. So we do so even now. In Jesus' name, amen.